Hi, everybody. Thanks for logging in. Um, we'll start in another three to four minutes, waiting for some more participants to join. Hi, everybody. Uh, just waiting for a few more people to join. We should start in another couple of minutes. Thanks for your patience. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I can see people joining in. So let's start off uh, since it's three o'clock and for those who logged in on time. Um, good afternoon and uh, thank you for logging in on this webinar uh, by Nosecape. Um, my name is Subramaniam, Subhu for short, uh, and I'll be your host uh, for the webinar today. Um, today we will be talking about um, a topic that's very close to everybody's hearts here, uh, I'm sure folks who have logged in. Uh, on the topic of engaging a multi-generational workforce. Uh, the webinar itself will go on for about uh, 30 to 40 minutes. Um, I'll try to keep it as concise as possible. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, you know, I help you get as much value as possible through this uh, for the next 30 to 40 minutes that we'll be online. Um, if you do have any questions, uh, feel free to post them in your chat box uh, that you have. You can type them out. Um, just so that we can do this webinar in a smooth way, I've muted all the participants. Uh, so if you do have any questions, uh, feel free to type them out uh, during the course of the webinar also, that's perfectly fine. Uh, it's just that I will be taking the questions towards the end. So I'll be answering your questions towards the end, but if you want to uh, post any questions while we are uh, 
in the webinar, feel free to do so. That's not a problem. Um, so without further ado, let's uh, start off. Um, right, so um, uh, once again, good afternoon for the folks who've joined in just now. Um, this is a hello from Bangalore, from whichever part of the world you're logging in. Um, as you're aware, this is the coverage, as you might have uh, seen in the marketing collaterals that we shared with you. Um, we'll begin with understanding, uh, getting an understanding of the different generations at work today. We'll start with this. This will help us set the context. Um, we will also try to break away from stereotypes of uh, the young and the old that we typically hear in the workforce. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of you will be able to relate to some of this. Um, and of course, we will end with uh, you know, what it means to be uh, in the era that we are in, right? So we are in, in the digital era where uh, agility and mobility um, and all of those aspects uh, that go with digital, um, uh, you know, hold true for all of us uh, in the environment that we operate in. So the context of operation is extremely important. Once we are done with uh, the context setting, um, I will, of course, take you through in much detail, as much detail as possible in the next half an hour um, on some core research ideas uh, that I had put across when I wrote my book um, called The Millennials. So a little bit of context here. Um, I wrote a book called The Millennials Exploring the World of the Largest Living Generation, which is about three years of focused research. And the book was published about a couple of years ago by Penguin. Um, and a lot of the, uh, the insights that you see here are directly from the book. Um, so while I researched and put together content for the book, I realized that it's very difficult to talk about uh, a particular generation or a cohort in isolation. Um, all of us work in a context, we work in an environment, uh, we work in industries which are unique to us. Um, so therefore it's important to uh, put all of that into consideration uh, and uh, enable constructive dialogue that helps bring about the best in all generations at work. So we are talking about uh, engaging the different generations at work today. So I will try and put across um, a few ideas and a few models of my own uh, and I hope that you'll be able to relate to it and make meaning of it and also go back and uh, try to apply these in your own organizations. I'm pretty sure that you would be uh, you know, applying a lot of these already in the roles that you're in as uh, leaders, HR managers or executives yourselves. Um, so I'm also keen to hear your thoughts on what you think on some of these. Um, let's take a step back or a couple of steps back um, until uh, I think till about this year. Um, the cutoff date for Gen Y or the millennials um, was not very clearly defined. So you have uh, different uh, demographic research bodies across the world uh, who do this kind of research and um, they put forth uh, cutoff dates for generations, right? So, um, and there are several of those. Um, the one that uh, uh, me, in, uh, me particularly and us at Mousecape, uh, the cutoff that we look at is, is from uh, this body called the Pure Research Center of the US. So this is how they define generations um, across different uh, age groups beginning from the 1920s all the way uh, till today, right? So um, if you see, there are uh, four generations here uh, on, your, on your screen right now, beginning with the silent generation who are pretty much retired today. Um, what you do have at the workforce are the baby boomers, the, the Gen Xers, and the millennials. Uh, and of course, you have the Gen Z, which is uh, which has already started entering the workforce. So if you if you were to look at this backwards, um, the, the cutoff date for millennials being 96 as per the Pew Research Center, uh, what that means is the oldest millennial today is already 37 years old, uh, and the youngest is about 22 years old, right? And you have the Gen Z who are at least uh, of, uh, you know, uh, of, of an adult age who are greater than 18 years of age, uh, they are in the age bracket of 18 to 22 as of today. If you were to go by this model, which the Pew Research Center puts together. Uh, so where that leaves us is that we have four generations operating at work today, which includes the baby boomers, the Gen Xers, the millennials, and uh, the Gen Z folks. So depending on where you are uh, working in the world, uh, if you're in India, you, uh, I'm sure you know that there are lots of millennials and Gen Zs already at the workplace, and we have a fairly young demographic uh, in the country as of now. Uh, probably not so uh, 
it's not the case in a country like Japan, for instance, where you have a largely aging population, uh, and therefore the demographic realities are very different than the kind of uh, context that you have, um, you know, countries with older populations is, is very different from a country like India, for instance, right? So that's um, setting the context in terms of uh, what generations, uh, the, the, the definitions of generations as we see it. Now, um, if that's the background, if, if you have four generations operating at work today, um, how do you really enable cultural transformation? Right? So that's the bigger question that we are after. Um, and um, there are three steps really, if you were to take a look at this. This is what we've established just now. Building intra and intergenerational engagement is a priority, right? And this is a priority for leaders, for managers, um, and uh, for everybody who's operating at the workplace today. And like I mentioned in certain sectors and geographies, millennials already make up a majority of the workforce, right? So you have the younger population making up the majority, at least in a country like India. Um, so therefore, what are organizations doing? So pioneering organizations have begun putting in place structures that bring out the best, not just in millennials, but in all generations. Um, conversations today largely revolve around similarities and differences between generations, right? Um, however, a lot of these observations may be exaggerated. As, as one example, um, uh, you know, although millennials and Gen Zs are uh, digital natives, uh, I'm sure you personally can think of uh, plenty of examples of people in your life, or at least a few examples of people in your life uh, who are Gen Xers or baby boomers who are equally, if not more adept at using some of the digital tools that millennials use very effectively today. Um, right. So um, therefore, you know, it, it's important to sort of balance ourselves as we make these observations. Um, and um, like I said, there's a unique opportunity today to focus on enabling cultural transformation, right? So how do you really groom your leaders? Um, and you have, you know, the scale of professionals wanting to learn, grow and make a difference um, exploring today. Right. So therefore, given this uh, context that we're operating, this is the cultural context. So how do you really bring about um, cultural transformation given these different generations operating at work today? There is, of course, the point of era, right? The era that we operate in, uh, how is it different today, let's say vis-a-vis -vis 20 years ago or 30 years ago? Right? Uh, so what did our parents see differently as they grew up and what are we seeing differently as we grow up? Uh, and what will our children therefore see differently as they grow up? Um, so, um, here, is a, here is a comparator, right? What does it mean to operate in a digital world? An analog world would largely be linear, whereas in a digital world, uh, things are non-linear. You see exponential growth uh, as the order of the day. You see uh, organizations that are winning uh, using this exponential growth philosophy doing so very effectively. Right? Um, in the analog world, uh, strategy would largely be uh, you know, constructed in the form of a map, right? So you would know, uh, you know, for instance, you set a strategic direction for about five years or 10 years, and you know where you're going. However, given the uncertainty that we operate in commonly referred to as VUCA, um, what we really have are just compasses, right? So you know what direction that you want to go in and you ensure that you do everything to go in that direction. Uh, if, if it's not working out, you post correct, maybe six months or one year down the line. So that's one. Um, if you look at uh, our own organizations, right, uh, there was uh, or there still is this tendency towards a hierarchical setup, a pyramidical setup, which is fairly mechanical. But uh, we all know in reality, our organizations operate very differently. They operate more like living systems. And you have these networks of uh, people who, uh, you know, collaborate, add value and so on. Um, and therefore, the, the reality is very different. So can we sort of reorient and rethink our organizational structures and processes and the way that we operate um, to align more with living systems, right? Uh, come to leadership. Uh, what was, you know, true at least till uh, many years ago was this command and control style of leadership where, you know, there was a lot of order and predictability was uh, easy, right? So leaders knew what was going on and they had more information and there was really no info, you know, there was no real case for information arbitrage between uh, folks, uh, you know, between levels in an organization. Today, uh, it's not true that the manager has more information than his or her subordinate. Because we live in an information age, access to information, technology, learning, all of that is easy. Therefore, how do you really move from 
you know, a command and control style of leadership to a more collaborative style, which is more empowering, which, uh, you know, produces, which, which has a, a sort of an emphasis on creation. And how do you really align your stakeholders, both internally and externally, to come together and work? Right. So that's the uh, that's the bigger question, right? So that's the uh, that's what we're really after. Okay. Um, uh, the ex you know somebody who had years of experience was much soft sought after uh, in the traditional way of working or in traditional organizations. Experience still holds good. It's not you know you completely cannot do away with uh, the experience that one brings to the table. However, what is also essential or what is also uh, you know, useful in the digital age is to have a beginner's mind, which is wherein, you know, you have this proverbial empty cup, you empty your mind every once in a while, learn something new and add to your repertoire of skills. Right? So how do you do this consistently is the question. Um, a specialist was somebody who was revered, who was, uh, you know, much sought after, uh, still is, uh, not denying that. However, uh, can you ask the right questions today, right? Because it's not easy to get answers. However, if you are able to ask the right questions and if you're a deep generalist, that's the terminology, um, you're able to make sense of all that is going around you, right? So this is the significance of era or the digital age that we live in. And you see a difference in the way that, uh, you know, uh, how we used to operate and how we operate today. Um, it's a, this is a, you know, a cheeky little quote by a composer. Uh, he knows everything, only lacks his inexperience. So what, what he's really trying to say is that it's important to uh, go after this beginner's mind point that we spoke about some time back and um, uh, empty the proverbial cup so that uh, you gain new information. Right. So um, now, now that the context is set and you know uh, we move away from that stereotypical discussion of what generations really want and set the context back again, um, the real questions that we that we would like to ponder on that I'm sure you ponder on as professionals yourselves are, um, let's start with motivation. Right? So how do self-driven executives outperform in their respective roles? What can managers do to better motivate their executives? How do you set up authentic workplace cultures driven by values in which all generations thrive? Right? Innovation is everybody's priority today and not just that of top management. So how do you ensure that you have these pockets of innovation in the organization? How do you move, uh, how do you leverage this uh, entire, uh, you know, uh, uh, the age of digital technology? How do you ensure that your executives leverage it to build destructive crops and services? How do you enable better collaboration between as well as within generations? How do you help your executives to pursue lifelong learning? And how do you uh, ensure that executives coach on, uh, you know, begin to coach early on in their careers? So um, there is, again, there is some data to, uh, to point to the fact that because uh, countries like India have a young demographic, uh, they're, they're very aspirational, right? So they want to move into leadership positions early on in their careers. Therefore, it's important to uh, imbibe coaching skills among millennials at an early stage in their careers. If you remember the age bracket, bracket that we spoke of was about 22 to 37. So that's an ideal time uh, for millennials to be moving into uh, a first time manager role or a you know, manager of manager role and so on, depending on where they are with respect to their performance. So therefore, how do you really uh, ensure that they get coached themselves so that they can lead their teams uh, effectively? So what does this mean really for teams and organizations? The seven questions that I posted earlier uh, translate into these seven lenses, so to say. Right? So you have motivation, culture, how do you drive innovation? How do you leverage digital? Uh, ensure that collaboration is happening. Uh, how do you help your executives learn continuously? And how is leadership looking different in the millennial age or in the digital age? However, this is not, you know, this is not the end all of it. Uh, if you were to go and ask an executive at the workplace how he or she feels about it, uh, they will tell you a different response or they'll probably talk to you differently about it. So here are some apparent contradictions. Right? So when it comes to motivation, now if you were to think about this individually as an executive yourself, um, think about this, right? So how do you balance intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation? Right? So how do you uh, operate in a culture that uh, seems authentic, but is, it's really dissonant? And we'll talk about what this means in a bit. How do you drive innovation while at the same time you also need to follow the rules of the game? How do you embrace digital disruption completely? 
how do you uh, also embrace a collaborative way of working while at the same time um, you know enabling deep work in the organization continuous learning and moving from a managing self to a leading others kind of a dimension so these are uh, you know questions that all of us grapple with uh, at the workplace uh, and this is you know not at the organization level this is at the individual level and what you see on the left hand side of the screen are um, more at the organization level right so answers and how they translate into um, what it means for individuals so uh, i'm not going to talk about all of these here uh, i'll i'm going to pick up a few and i'm going to leave you with a couple of case studies in terms of how some of these organizations are looking at these lenses uh, within themselves uh, let's begin with motivation i'm sure some of you might know this uh, motivation 1.0 this is from daniel pink's book drive uh he says that uh, 1.0 is all about basic survival needs 2.0 is all about punishing bad behavior and rewarding good motives and most organizations are stuck in this spectrum of how do i balance extrinsic versus intrinsic right um what daniel pink says is that uh, organizations need to badly move to this uh, spectrum of motivation 3.0 which is an upgrade if you were to think about this as an operating system this is an upgrade that's badly needed um where an intrinsic motivation sits at the heart of what uh, executives do in organizations uh, and extrinsic motivation is of course uh, supports you know uh, supports that it's hygiene you need to ensure that your executives are paid well for the work that they do right now to be able to enable this there are three levers um, is what daniel pink says begins with autonomy uh, it's it it you know uh, comes from this drive of our need to be autonomous and self directed mastery how do you become better at something that matters and uh, purpose right so why do i do what i do and why should i wake up on a monday morning and come to work um so these are the uh, you know uh, three levers uh, called self determination theory of motivation um and motivation uh, if you were to look at the first lens as we spoke of uh, this is how it unfolds right and this is how you can look at it from an organization's perspective how do you move from this motivation 2.0 to uh, 3.0 these are the bigger questions that organizations are grappling with today <clears throat> Let's look at culture now. Um, here is a, a nice quote from uh, uh, the head of employee experience at Airbnb. Notice how um, he talks about uh, not just job titles um, and the equity. Uh, I'm sorry, not just job titles, but then uh, the equity of uh, changing the world through connecting people via local and authentic travel experiences. This is what um, Airbnb is all about. It's what it stands for. So what do you really hire for do you hire for job titles do you hire for uh, a deeper purpose that your organization um, speaks to and do people connect with it right and there are three ways again to look at this from the perspective of the self the team and the organization and if you were to ask certain questions um, from these three areas these are you know questions that um, typically people ask themselves right uh take the first column on your on the table on the screen uh do i bring my best self to work every day is my work meaningful are my ideas encouraged or ignored so these are quest these are self right these are personal questions now if you were to if if one were to think about the team um and this is uh, you know irrespective of generations uh, does my manager support me right do i get enough opportunities to engage and collaborate um do we have fun at work and the organization of course do i connect with this purpose uh, here for instance of airbnb of connecting people via local and authentic travel experiences are my values aligned do my leaders live the values right if they don't then there is a kind of a dissonance in my mind of uh, what my leaders say and what they do right um let me give you an example of that here if you were to look at it as a simple 2 by 2 um let me take you through this very quickly an organization's beliefs and values are on the x axis and the actions and behaviors of leaders and employees are on the y axis right now these beliefs and values may be either explicit or they might be implicit right and if uh, and the actions and behaviors might either be aligned to these values or they may misaligned be misaligned to the values right let's start with one quadrant here let's start with what this means okay um or no let's start with uh, this one here let's say the beliefs and values of an organization are implicit they have not been stated yet uh, but people sort of know what they are right uh, however the leaders and uh, executives around me don't really act in a way that it's in alignment with these implicitly stated values 
So here is an opportunity for the leadership team to first make these values explicit and ensure that the alignment is there. So it's a two pronged approach. It's the most difficult part that right? you haven't yet made your beliefs and values explicit. You need to do that first and also take corrective measures to ensure that people live the values. Okay? Um, the, probably the most uh, difficult uh, scenario is, is this one, which is dissonance, right? So what has happened is that your values are explicit. However, um, as in people know, it's, it's all over your workplace. You've uh, put stickers and posters all over. However, you don't see people acting according to these values, right? So immediately there is a dissonance in the minds of not just your millennials, but also the Gen Xers and uh, baby boomers and everybody else in the organization. So there's a dissonance, there is a disconnect, right? Uh, of what is being told and what is really being played out in the organization, right? Uh, this is a good place to be, wherein the values are implicit, but uh, you know, it's aligned, right? So people are like, oh, wow. You know, even without telling us what the values are explicitly, I can see that my leaders are operating in that manner. And what most companies aspire for is this uh, quadrant here, which is all about being authentic, right? So, uh, which is of course the most difficult uh, part of it all, which is being explicit about your values and ensuring that your leaders and at least your managers are true to these um, values and they act and behave accordingly, right? Um, this was one of the most pivotal points that I uh, found through my research, which is that if you if you're able to construct authentic workplaces, wherein day in and day out your um, leaders, managers, and therefore your executives uh, live, breathe, and act according to the beliefs and the values they hold dear, um, the culture sort of thrives. Right? Uh, it's no easy task, but then it takes a lot of effort, and those who do it well are able to see the results. I'm going to give you a case study now or an example very quickly of, uh, of uh, a company uh, here in India which is trying to do exactly that. So Make a Difference is a, uh, is a non-governmental organization, it's a developmental organization um, and they mobilize young leaders to ensure equitable outcomes for children in shelters. So it's largely a volunteer-led organization, there is no uh, you know, monetary rewards as such. So people spend their time out of uh, connecting to this purpose of the organization um, and they uh, and they share right so what is the culture that make a difference comprise of it's built on three core values uh, cause above self leadership through ownership and sense of family so these are their core values uh, and also let me make a mention that about 80 percent of this organization is millennial right so a lot of these uh, youngsters who uh, you know make their own time out to volunteer and contribute uh, do so out of their own time. They don't really ask in return. And these values are supported by three operating principles, as they call it, right? Which is integrity, servant leadership, and acting in a professional way. Now, when I interviewed the CEO of this organization, he came up with a very interesting quote in the way that he was looking at the organization, um, uh, the, the, the structure and the processes, right? So he said, as organizations grow, they typically tend towards uh, trend towards control systems and hierarchies, right? Um, but that only makes it even more complex and transparency goes down. However, if you are able to uh, bring in flexibility, right? And uh, ensure that the organization is able to adapt and evolve and uh, really build for agility rather than hierarchy and rigidity, uh, you know, while the cost may be high and uh, which is not really so is what he says. Uh, and this last line is very interesting. While the perceived challenge in building a flexible organization might seem greater, there isn't actually much of a difference in terms of real cost, right? which, uh, which they feel is better deployed towards positive design. And what does this design really um, comprise of? It comprises of two aspects, soft aspects and hard aspects. I'm going to touch upon the soft aspect first. Here are the soft aspects, right? So um, as I was writing my book, um, Make a Difference was in this transformation process, right? So moving from what you see on the left hand side, which is, you know, a permissions driven culture as one example, to a recommendations one, you know, instructions giving culture to an initiative taking one, a reviewing culture to an empowerment one, transactional culture to an appreciative one and so on, right? Um, so this is what they want, the softer aspects of their culture is what they wanted to change. Um, and one way in which they were doing that is through adopting the agile framework in the way that they work, right? Um, 
So those of you who come from a software background, I'm sure you know this, right? So the way that it played out and make a difference is, is what I've uh, listed up here, right? So how do you really bring together a purpose-oriented approach to design? Uh, minimum useful documentation. And what this Scrum Agile framework does is that it insulates the organization against the risk of losing data, right? Um, so there are lots of levers that go into uh, constructing such an organization. Uh, I'm sharing the idea here and some uh, pointers and how make a difference was uh, doing it, right? Um, take the second or the third lever, which is collaboration. Here's another very interesting uh, quote from this report by uh, IBM, right? The, the, the core point of this quote is that, you know, high performing executives, uh, and again, millennials here, but then all kinds of uh, executives want to work in a collaborative organization where they're encouraged to contribute new ideas. Uh, right, so uh, the key takeaway here or the insight is that is the last line again there on the quote as you see, um, as workplaces become more workplaces become more virtual, they need to consider how they can bring up, bring about collaboration through tools that can leverage the latest cloud and mobile technology. So again, you have the harder stuff and the softer stuff here. The hard stuff again is is in the way that you um, manage your office space as an instance, right? So how much of your office should be open? and how much should be closed um, that will enable collaboration. How do different uh, or how do different departments sort of come together and collaborate? That's one. Um, another, the software aspect is of course, these tools that you see here, what kind of tools will you uh, put in so that uh, people are able to, uh, you know, communicate faster, share information faster, work out loud and so on and so forth. Right. Um, let me give you an example here. Um, this is the GSK office, I think in Colombia. And you see the way that the office space has been designed, right? Um, now, this is not optimal uh, as we speak, uh, and I'm sure you know this yourself, organizations are uh, experiment with, uh, experimenting with all kinds of office space designs, but this is just one to spark ideas, right? To spark thoughts in your mind. Um, so if you see there, are, there's a lot of, uh, lot of stuff happening here. So um, <clears throat> take this for example, tables are, are at angles, right? Um, so that uh, people can talk to each other easily. Right. Uh, there are lots of quiet spaces. So although it's an open office space, if you see, there's a quiet zone, there is a quiet room, uh, there is a cul-de-sac area that gives space space for working quietly. Um, right. So it's not like it's an open office through and through. It's been designed thoughtfully in a, in a way that people can also sit quietly and work for hours together if the need, uh, the need arises. Right. You have uh, the traditional conference room, space for meetings and so on and so forth. It gives you an idea of, of the structure or the layout of, um, of a modern open office space, which balances uh, collaboration and individual contribution very well. That's the hard stuff. The softer stuff, right? So how do you ensure that video conferences are in place? You have group wikis for sharing, uh, blogs, virtual communities through enterprise social networks, uh, Slack as, as one example. <clears throat> and a whole bunch of other tools, right? Working out loud. So uh, all of these can enable collaboration within an organization. Um, and this is to the point of how do we, uh, you know, enable collaboration between teams, um, wherein you have, you know, different kinds of workers from millennials to Gen Z's to baby boomers and Gen Xers all working together uh, side by side. Uh, learning becomes very important, uh, especially in the digital age, as you might be aware. Right, so there are two kinds of learning. There is continuous learning, uh, which is you know divergent, wherein if you're an HR professional, you might uh, learn a little bit about budgeting, spreadsheet automation, and so on. Or if you are uh, an analytics professional, you might go after convergent learning. Right? So if you are an R professional, for an instance, uh, R is a programming language in analytics, you might uh, go deeper into R. There are two ways in which you can learn. And there are, of course, a whole bunch of tools that support this kind of learning. Uh, again, as an example, uh, Big Basket is, a, is an almost unicorn in India. Um, and here's a quote again from TN Hari, who I interviewed for the book. Um, you know, the kind of learning opportunities that one gets is dependent on tough situations, stretch goals, chaos, uncertainty, right? You need to have all of these. Um, and being able to do well in the realm of a startup is almost synonymous to having a mindset of continuous learning or a growth mindset in other words. Right? Um, and here's the essence of the big basket culture for you to get some context. They have a maniacal focus on customer design, right? Taking ownership, speed of speed and a sense of urgency, freedom. 
and these are their values. <clears throat> so given this context, how does Big Basket really enable learning in the organization? There are five levers that they use in their organization, right? Uh, take a look. So stretch goals and assignments. There is coaching, uh, cross-functional meetings so that people can know what's happening in other teams, uh, classroom training and inside sessions where experts from outside come and give talks. And of course, a lot of on-demand learning through MOOCs and other platforms. Right? So there are different levers that they pull to enable learning in the organization. Right? Uh, the last sort of, uh, you know, uh, Lever here for us uh, is about uh, the leadership part. Right? Uh, executive coaching has always been on the purview of CEOs and top management. However, uh, and of course, senior coaches, many of whom may be industry professionals, um, work alongside leaders. We all know this. Right? Of late, however, what's been happening is that organizations have set up internal coaching practices. Um, there was a report that came out in HBR that said that millennials value the benefits of coaching, right? So do you in your organization have a structure where uh, the older professionals coach younger professionals such as millennials is a question that's, that you might want to think about. Um, another report that said millennials relish the chance to work with strong coaches and mentors. Um, and here is a counterpoint also, while they may learn a lot by being coached, um, they may also want to uh, learn or apply coaching themselves, especially when they move into first time manager roles. Right? So how do you really enable this? And some, uh, you know, again, some pointers to uh, spark thoughts for you. So if you were to uh, reimagine the role of a manager as not just being an administrative professional who manages performance, but as more uh, as somebody who's a coach, um, here are some things that younger professionals today uh, really, really enjoy. And right on top of that, as you see, is providing autonomy and guiding progress, right? So uh, there's no micromanagement, trusting the person, right? Building trust, um, comfortable stepping back, encouraging participative decision making, a safe space for experimentation, uh, accountability, catching people doing great work, right? So this is counterintuitive. We all feel that we should uh, only catch people doing not so great work. How do you show genuine care and concern? Uh, look at the bigger picture, lead by influence and not just by authority. Right? So if you were to sort of, uh, you know, realign or relook at the role of a manager uh, as a coach, then this becomes very powerful. This becomes a great engine for you to drive organization culture um, with, uh, you know, having a coaching driven uh, sort of an outlook uh, within your organization. Right? So uh, I'm almost done with my presentation and I'll open it in just a minute for questions. This is sort of summarizing it. Um, so in conclusion, uh, you know, it's, it's very important to refer, uh, to, a, a, to not just refer any, to any one cohort in isolation, a multi-level 360 degree approach is, is something that, uh, everybody appreciates. Right. Um, as I said, autonomy, mastery and purpose can help foster intrinsic motivation. Uh, do you drive this in your organization? Um, how do you really craft authentic workplaces? How do you really do this, right? It's a bigger question again. Um, the values can translate into several meaningful outcomes. Continuous innovation. Community-led setups that drive engagement and innovations. You know, this is the opposite of the hierarchical setup that we spoke of earlier. So can you have hackathons as one example, right? A lot of companies really drive hackathons. <clears throat> How do you ensure that there is continuous learning in the organization? Um, the last point of coaching. Right? So how do you ensure that driving a coaching culture? Okay, so that's about it. And that's the call to action for you. Um, if not, ask them who, and if not now, then when. Uh, right, so uh, if you have do have any questions, uh, please feel free to post them and we will wind up in another uh, five minutes. It, it depends on how many questions we get. Um, thank you for being a lovely audience and for patiently listening in. Uh, and I'm going to open it now for questions. If you have any questions, feel free to type it uh, in the Q&A section. I have it open in front of me. Uh, I'm not, uh, you know, switching on the microphones because it gets too noisy with uh, all of us talking together at the same time. So if you do have any questions, feel free to post them, um, and I can see them on my uh, on my screen here. <clears throat>
I have one comment that says great presentation. Thank you. Not sure who gave me. Uh... Okay, I have. Uh... Right. Um, so two questions, I'm going to take them one after the other. Uh, and just a point here, if I'm unable to answer any of your uh, questions, I will, of course, uh, come back to you separately. We have your, uh, we have your details with us. Okay, let me do the first one. Since you spoke of innovation, how do you get your team members uh, to become more innovative on a daily basis? Um, so uh, I would go back to that, uh, to that, the framework of the self team and organization that I showed you earlier, right? Um, innovation really starts at, starts at the self, which is, you know, if you want to be creative, you will at least try to be in the way that you work on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is irrespective of generations again. Um, uh, at, at a team level, I think it's important that managers sort of actively uh, groom their team members uh, in the way that they, uh, you know, conduct their day-to-day -day work. That's at the team level. And organization, of course, you need to have a leader at the top or at least leaders at the top who, uh, who drive innovation as an agenda in more ways than one, right? So I'm not quite sure who asked this question, but uh, if, if, if that sort of answers, a self team and uh, you know, organization again, gives you a very uh, broad perspective of looking at innovation and also implementing it on the ground. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to take the next question, which is by Arun Yarla. Uh, Arun says, uh, insightful talk, thank you, thanks uh, Arun. Um, he says, you spoke about older generations, coaching younger, uh, is something that uh, is preferred by millennials. How about reverse mentoring and how does the older generation feel about it? So um, again, lots of examples of organizations that are implementing this today um, and these are happening for specific subjects. So um, if you were to talk about digital technology, you have companies like Unilever and PepsiCo who have gone on record saying that they have reverse mentoring programs um, wherein you know a young shadow board or a young uh, board of millennials or Gen Zs um, actively coach their younger leaders on specific topics. Um, the feedback that I've got uh, in speaking to some of those organizations is that it's largely been useful um, and different organizations are ex experimenting with this in different ways, if that answers your question. <clears throat> okay. Um, I'm going to go on to some of the other questions that I have. Um, Ashika asks me, I like the quadrant that mentioned the organization beliefs and leaders alignment. What is the source of the quadrant? So that's the, uh, that's something that I created myself, Ashika. Uh, uh, and uh, if you're interested, of course, I'm happy to share it with you and you can use it in however, uh, whatever form you might want to uh, use it for. Uh, the, the source really is, is the research that I did in, in the process of writing the book that I spoke of earlier as I started the presentation. Um, and you know the data that I collected and the conversations that I had led to that con led to the quadrant getting formed, sort of to explain what it means to have an authentic versus a dissonant culture. If that answers your question. Um, don't you think uh, Lakshmi Venugopal asks a very insightful question? Uh, she says, uh, "Don't you think every generation in their earlier years behave the same at the workplace? They do, and in fact, there is." Uh, you know, research to support just that. There is a researcher by the name of Jean Twenge who did exactly this uh, research that you're talking about, Lakshmi, which which is essentially, you know, can we ask the same set of questions uh, to all generations while they were at a particular age? So today, for instance, I'm 33, 34 years of age. So if you were to ask uh, my father when he was 34, the same set of questions, and therefore, you know, ask three generations the same set of questions, will you get markedly different responses. Um, the research says no, uh, there is not much of a variance. Uh, so youngsters, for instance, being passionate is something that we see in every generation. It's not, it's got nothing to do with generations really. It's more about um, the age, right? So when you're young, you are that much more passionate. You mellow down as you grow older. Um, and that's a, that's an insight, which is why I opened the presentation saying that let's break away from stereotypes about generations and talk about uh, real challenges that we're all facing, which are solvable. I hope that answers your question, um, Lakshmi. I'm scrolling through some of the other questions that I have in front of me. <clears throat> okay, um, Alina asks me, 
uh, says thank you so much for the presentation. Thank you, Alina. Where would you start if you would uh, lead L and D in a top-down baby boomers company? Um, it's not again. It's not a you know. It's not a question that I can answer right away, Alina. I would probably have to ask you ten other questions to understand your context a little better. Um, but if it helps, again, you know, the point that I just made earlier in response to Lakshmi's question, uh, maybe you want to move away from uh, you know the generations part of it and look at it from an age perspective, um, which is that you probably have. Uh, older employees in your organization. So, so therefore, the way that they uh, consume information is different or maybe different, I'm not quite sure. But then we need to get a little more contextual information and data uh, for me to answer uh, that question, right? So maybe I can take it offline if you, if, uh, I'll also give you my email address at the end of this and we can have a conversation around that and I'm more than happy to chat around. A couple of more, uh, yeah, Alina, I've answered. <clears throat> Pallavi asks, um, every new change in the organization is perceived in a different manner from employees across generations. How do we manage those expectations and drive their engagement and implementation, implementing the change um, in business? So uh, your question, Pallavi, is more around uh, you know, change management and implementing change in an organization. Again, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not an easy question to answer. Um, but if you were to bring in the generational angle again, because that's what we're talking about, um, you know, again, there are different ways of doing it, right? So typically we talk about the push and the pull approach. Uh, you know that you need that push from the top if it's a meaningful change that the organization is driving. Uh, otherwise, you don't see action on the ground. And that's the reality of any organization today. However, um, the softer aspects, right, which is the pull factor, how do you really, uh, you know, make it attractive for the employees to embrace the change. Let me give you an example. Um, at Nowscape, till I think till last year is when we had uh, you know different kinds of uh, communication channels. There was WhatsApp, there was Google Hangouts. Um, however, we adopted Slack as a communication channel very recently uh, in the organization. Now, uh, Slack is very intuitive as a product. It's great, and you can you know do a lot of things, and people easily move. However, uh, we still have folks who. Uh, you know, use WhatsApp every now and then, right? So, uh, and every now and then the CEO himself uh, sort of posts a message on WhatsApp saying, guys, can we please move on to Slack? Because, you know, it gets complicated if you have two lines of channels running, right? So let's put everything in one place. Um, so it's not easy, right? So which is the push and the pull factor. Uh, if, if that answers, again, if you have anything more specific, I'm happy to answer them and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll share my email address and we can have a conversation. I'm more than happy to. Um, but for the for the question that you've asked here, I hope you've answered. I have answered your question. Okay, um, I think that's pretty much all the questions uh, that were asked by all of you. Um, and uh, once again, thank you for uh, for logging in. If there are no more questions, uh, what I will do very quickly is that I will share my coordinates here um, so that you can get in touch. Just give me one second. Yeah, just a, just a sidebar here on what we do as an organization. We work with a whole bunch of organizations, as you see on the screen, um, and we have a range of uh, products uh, for you. If you're interested, feel free to reach out to us. Um, and these are my coordinates. Um, so you see the email address there. You can also write to marketing at mousecape.com uh, and my email answer if you have any uh, anything at all. You can follow us and me on uh, Twitter also. Um, thank you. Uh, thanks, Pallavi. And thanks, everybody else, for uh, being patient, for listening in, and for logging in. Um, uh, and, I, and we hope to uh, you know, also engage you through other webinars that we will have, and we will send you communication on that. And if there is anything else, feel free to reach out to us. Thank you, and uh, goodbye.